Welcome back to week five. In the second segment related to the right to be forgotten, I will present the arguments from both sides of the, uh, of the debate, those that support or oppose such a right or its global implementation. And I will end with some uh, general conclusions regarding the right to be forgotten. Much has been written on the impact of the European Court of Justice ruling on the uh, freedom of expression online. I will identify here a few arguments on both sides of the debate. There are now two debates, whether the right to be delisted constitutes a valid right or a violation to the right of freedom of expression, and secondly, whether a global implementation of delisting is particularly damaging and dangerous for global freedom of expression. Let's first consider the, 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 the questions regarding the existence or not of a right to be forgotten. Arguments against a right to be forgotten have um, been well circulated around the online community. The right to be forgotten centers around the, um, the, the individual's ownership over data that may have a public interest and that go beyond the uh, individual himself or herself. For example, the fact that a particular individual was declared bankrupt 10 years ago is not simply information about that person. It also involves his or her debtors. It also involves a decision in an open court. The idea that it is the individual who should retain ultimate control over that particular information ignores the broader right of the public to share and receive materials that is legitimately in the public domain. The threshold proposed by the European Court of Justice is unclear, according to many commentators, and I will have to, to agree with them. It could result in issues of public interest to be deleted or forgotten. Insofar as the information is already public, is already in the public domain, there is a strong interest in preserving it and in, in it remaining easily accessible for research, archiving or due diligence purposes. So these are some of the arguments against the idea that there is a right to be forgotten. On the other hand, there are a number of arguments in favor of the right to be forgotten or delisted in the digital world. I will spend a little bit more time on those arguments because they tend to be less well known by um, the free speech community. A range of arguments are linked to uh, the right to a personality including the right to privacy and data protections, rights that have been mostly developed and adjudicated in continental Europe. Essentially, the argument for a right to be forgotten is predicated on the concept that individuals should be able to decide on the possible use of their own data, with reference to their own autonomy and right to personal development, two concepts which we have discussed in the first week of this course and two concepts which are, interestingly enough, at the heart of the concept of freedom of expression. Such a right may be particularly invoked in cases of old criminal records which are no longer relevant or carry no public interest, but which may impact negatively on an individual's ability to work, for instance, or hamper their ability to obtain the credit they need or simply prevent them from living their lives with dignity. Such a right to have uh, old criminal records revoked is actually already in place in, in many countries in the offline world. Why, so the argument goes, could not be exported into the online world? For some years now, grassroots social movements in Europe have called for a right to be forgotten, alarmed by the lasting consequences of online posting. 
So for instance, in France in 2010, as a result of pressure emanating from association of parents, as well as children rights and Catholic organizations, the French government adopted two charters related to the right to be forgotten. And to a large extent, the European Court of Justice decision was very much in keeping with a strong social demand in Europe, in particular, regarding privacy. Even in the United States, there is some probably far lighter movement towards recognition of a right to be forgotten. In September 2013, California passed the so-called California Eraser Statute, requiring the operator of an internet website, online service, online application or mobile application to permit a minor with a registered user of the operator's website to obtain a removal or to request and obtain removal of certain content or information posted. While it is far narrower in terms of the scope and the audience concern than the European Court for Justice right to be delinked decision, the California Eraser Statute does underscore social anxieties and pressure and the determination of the political and legislative sectors to draw some boundaries and to draw on the law to establish those boundaries. Again, in the United States as well, there has been a number of legal initiatives to address and curtail so-called revenge porn website, mugshot website, all of these testify to the increasing conflict over the reach and use of internet in a time perspective, not just in a geographical perspective. There are other arguments in uh, favor that support the right to be forgotten uh, indirectly are those related to the way Google has implemented the decisions and what that decision shows when implemented. Individuals whose removal requests are denied have the opportunity to appeal Google's decision to their national data protection authorities. But data so far indicate that less than 1% of Google's decisions are appealed. Whenever Google agree or do not agree to delist a content, only 1% of those decisions are appealed. And I think this is very revealing of, of the process and of people's relationship with uh, the decision. As of June 2016, Google had evaluated something like 1.5 million URL arising from the European implementation of um, the right to privacy and they had approved 57% for removal. So they had done so of their, um, you know, of their own accord. There are other arguments regarding the right um, to be forgotten and um, why it is not posing the threat to the right to information that some had envisaged initially. Contrary to initial fears regarding the misuse of the right to be forgotten and the risk it posed for the right to access information, the vast majority of the requests made to Google for delisting originate from members of the public. 95% of those demands originate from members of the public who are seeking to protect their private information and less than 5% came from criminals, politicians, or public figures. So that's a very uh, revealing demonstration, I think, of um, the way the right to be forgotten is understood and is uh, being um, approached from the public standpoint. Secondly, Individuals whose removal requests are denied have the opportunity to appeal Google's decision to their national data protection. And so far, 
only 1% of Google's decisions have been appealed according to the data available at the time of uh, writing this segment. 1% only. As of June 2016, Google had evaluated 1.5 million URL arising from the European implementation of the right to be forgotten, and they had approved 57% for removal. Again, a very interesting um, uh, figures. And of those uh, 57, of the, all of those decisions made by Google, only 1% had been appealed. So altogether, the implementation of the right to be forgotten, at least at national level, does indicate that it can be put in place without major implications for um, the right to access information and for the public interest. That is for the first debate. The second debate concerns the global versus restricted implementation of the right to be forgotten. And here there are many arguments against uh, a global implementation, which I am gonna, I'm going to highlight. First, it is disproportionate and unnecessary, given that the overwhelming majority of Internet users access a European version of Google search engine. Here I'm talking from the standpoint of uh, a European uh, user. Um, so if you live in France, 97% of French uh, internet users will work with google.fr rather than google.com. So, you know, in and by itself, this testifies to the fact that restricting the implementation of the right to be forgotten to google.fr is largely sufficient to, um, to ensure that the vast majority of the French citizens do not have access to the problematic delisting. Second, a second argument against the global uh, reach of the right is that it will have a chilling effect if enforced. According to Google, and I'm quoting from them here, we will find ourselves in a race to the bottom. In the end, the internet would only be as free as a world less free place. Every country in the world could ask for a global delisting of something, resulting in a very restricted and shrinking uh, online space for information. Google chief privacy officer points out in particular that, and I quote, there are innumerable examples around the world where content that is declared illegal under the laws of one country would be deemed legal in others. Thailand criminalizes speech that is critical of its king. Turkey criminalizes some speech that is critical of Ataturk. And Russia outlaws some speech that is deemed to be gay propaganda. What are we going to do if all of these governments request for those content to be delisted globally. Finally, Google believes that, and I quote, no one country should have the authority to control what content someone in a second country can access. In a follow-up argument, Google argued that if the French law applied globally, that the French decision, how long will it be until other countries perhaps less open and democratic, start demanding that their laws regulating information have global reach. So that, I think, argument is a, a very solid and a very important argument regarding the risk that a global implementation of the right to be delisted will have on freedom of expression when every government, why not after all, make similar demands as the French government has or as the Canadian court has made. So what are the arguments that uh, support the um, global implementation of the right to be forgotten? The first one, and it is an important one to remember because I think we tend to forget it, 
is that the delisting of um, an extension in Google, in particular, or another search uh, engine, does not limit freedom of expression because it does not involve the removal of content on the internet. It only withdraws a link from a Google search based on the first and last name of a person complaining and wishing for their right to be forgotten, asking for such a right. However, those pages remain accessible when is the search is made, is made using other words. The, um, the content is never deleted from internet, just the way to access that content is limited. Also, the uh, people who support a global implementation point out that Google has been implementing such a global delisting for years uh, to implement the American copyright law. So if it can abide by US copyright law globally, why can't it do it and apply European privacy law internationally? So does the argument go? There are far more removal requests due to copyright concern than privacy issue. Quoting from a Google report themselves, in one month only, Google says it has received 88 million requests to remove URL due to alleged copyright infringement. These are all governed by the American Digital Millennium Copyright Act. By contrast, Google has assessed 1.5 million requests for removal due to the right to be forgotten in the entire period since May 2014. 88 million in one month for removal of copyright product versus 1.5 million removals over more than a year. So I think um, these kind of arguments highlight possibly some of the biases in um, the way Google and other search engines are um, interacting with some of the content and some of the demands for removal, putting far more emphasis on the copyright aspect than on the privacy issue. And here we're going into um, a possible conflict of norms between Europe and the United States, uh, with Europe having placed far more emphasis and focus on the right to privacy than um, under the American system. So far, only one country, France, seems to have insisted on a global delisting, while only one court has upheld the extraterritorial approach. Google, as I have mentioned, is looking for a technical solution through the use of geolocation signals, which I think is a reasonable um, approach, even though it has been so far rejected by the French administrative entity. We will have to wait for the decisions by uh, the French uh, Conseil d'État to see how the extraterritorial implementation of the right to be forgotten will be implemented, at least when uh, the demand comes from France. So in conclusion, the right to be forgotten, delisted or de-indexed raises many issues and questions which are bound to generate further interpretation and different rulings around the world. First, the extent to which courts cite legal interpretation by other jurisdictions of new legal and technical issues they are being asked to adjudicate, the way in which they do so, and what it means for the emergence of global norms on freedom of expression. Those, this body of issues is uh, very much exemplified by the way the right to be forgotten is being handled and treated by courts around the world who rely on each other's decisions 
because they are dealing with such a new issue and a difficult one, both technically but also normatively. Second, the extent to which there is a universal right to be forgotten and what this means for the online world, the conditions under which this may be permissible and the responsibilities and duty bearers the implementation of this right is generating. This is a second set of questions which is um, at the heart of many of the normative debates, particularly opposing the um, tradition in Europe around the importance of the right to privacy and that of the United States where such rights has generally not been recognized to the same extent. And then the third body of questions co concern the um, implications of adopting a global interpretation of the right to be de-indexed and what it means in terms of the extraterritorial reach of a particular state outside the boundaries of their national jurisdictions. This is a third set of challenge raised by the right to be forgotten and a very important one. With regard to this last point, I have argued in, in one article included in your readings that approaching de-indexation from the standpoint of the concept of committee raises many interesting uh, issues and possibility. The Canadian ruling hints to an approach to the question of de-indexing based on a case-by-case -case approach and a review of nuanced criteria which could include, for instance, the nature of the expression or information concerned with the delisting, the value from a freedom of expression standpoint based on international standards, the position of the listing that a Google search generates nationally and regionally. These are some of the uh, criteria that could be used to determine whether a delisting should become global or not. So unlike the French uh, decisions, I am not arguing that every delisting should be made global, but on the other hand, it does not mean that some of them could not be made global. In a recently published uh, policy brief, Article 19 suggests a seven-part test to balance the right to be forgotten with the right to freedom of expression. Globally speaking, data regarding court cases indicates that the right to be forgotten has become largely accepted by users, by national administration, including privacy or data protection commissions and court. The main challenge ahead will thus be first and foremost whether it can be implemented beyond the country from where the demand came from. It may be expected that on this issue as well, national courts will make the final determination. Thank you very much.